This is Tom Daly with uh, Deerfield Oral History Project, and our guest today is Dan Matthews. So welcome, Dan. Thank you, Thank Let's you. Let's begin uh, with your full name and where you were born. I'm Daniel Paul Matthews. I was born in Chicago, Illinois, on January 14, 1933. Okay. What is the, we're going to go way back, what is the earliest, uh, who is the earliest ancestor that you know about? Well, uh, several, but the one that I know most about is my grandfather, who was a Presbyterian minister and, uh, and uh, went to Hanover College in Hanover, Indiana, uh, near, near Louisville, and uh, spent most of his life in Indiana as a Presbyterian minister, though he was also in Iowa and Michigan. And he had uh, a wife who was an interesting, my grandmother, author of three novels, and uh, she was a graduate of uh, Cincinnati Wesleyan. So for her to have graduated from college in, in 1870, <laughs> and he before that in uh, Hanover, Indiana, about as far back as I know a lot. Uh, but before that, they're just kind of names. But okay. those are my mother and father. The other side of my family is my mother, and that she was a Mississippi woman, grew up in a town called Canton, Mississippi, went to Bell Haven College, which is a Presbyterian school. And uh, she got uh, associated with my father who was with Billy Sunday as the evangelist, mm -hmm. private secretary, and pianist. And he traveled, and he traveled to Jackson, Mississippi, and heard the Bell Haven Choir sing under the direction of a student director, my mother. And uh, the famous story in the family was my mother said to my father they were going to sing at the Tabernacle in Jackson, where they had built it for the Billy Sunday religious campaign. And uh, my mother turned to my father at the grand piano and said, can you play such and such in B flat or something? And my father looked up and saw this beautiful woman standing at the end of the grand piano. And he said, my dear, for you, I can play it in any key you want. <laughs> and six weeks later, they were married, which was interesting because he was 27 years older than she was. Oh, she was a senior in college at 20, and he had never married at 47. And when they married, uh, they took off, and mother had never been out of the state of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And in the first six years, she visited about 16 states in the country to traveling with Mr. Sunday. Now, how long did they continue doing that? They continued they until, until yeah. Mr. Sunday retired. Uh -huh. Then they became a part of a radio program called Uncle Bob and Aunt Martha in uh, uh, WHAS in Lowell, which was a clear channel radio station in those days. And they did that for a while until the Depression hit and they the bank that sponsored their program went out of business broke mm -hmm. uh, because of the Depression. And they moved to Chicago, where I was born. And uh, that was all during the Depression. And musicians had a hard time during the Depression, as you know. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the reason I was born in Chicago. Then I left Chicago, so I may move on. And we moved to Kentucky for three years for a small town where my father was the band director. And then wound up moving in the middle of the war, World War II, to Canton. North Carolina, which of course is here in sure. Western North Carolina, and where the big paper mill is. And the big paper mill then, called Champion International, in a sense sponsored the high school band. They bought all the instruments and the band uniforms and all, because the band was able in those days to play for events at the mill. So if somebody retired after 50 years, they would play for a half hour or an hour and my father was subsidized and therefore he moved. And there, so I went to grammar school and high school in Canton, moving from Chicago. Mm -hmm. Well, I, when I moved, I didn't have the accent. I sounded like somebody from Chicago. So I was, uh, you know, say something Yankee at recess. 
And so I never got the accent. I never got to be able to speak correctly. Mm -hmm. And I, I fell in love with the mountains and wound up in building the swag years later, right, right outside of Canton you know, on the edge of the park. So that's the origin of my having had roots in both Mississippi right. and Kentucky, and then winding up being a part of Canton for high school. Do you remember the building that you lived in as a child? Yes, the indeed. House. The, the house in Chicago, 8016 Kim Bark Avenue, on the south side of Chicago, not too far from the University of Chicago. And that neighborhood began changing and, went out, and now is, is known for South Chicago, where Obama grew up, not far from where, where I grew up. Okay. Um, what was the neighborhood like? The neighborhood was a middle-class neighborhood across the street. A doctor lived. We had a nice home. The, the, uh, the neighborhood school was called Avalon Park Grammar School. Every year it won the award for the prettiest grounds around, you know, flowers and grass and so forth. It's an urban inner city school now. All those grounds are paved. They're blacktop now and the kids play on them. But it isn't anything like it was. It's now an urban school, an urban city, and uh, the south side of Chicago has changed greatly since I was there, yeah. So you, you said a, a little bit about the schools you attended. What other uh, schools besides the grammar school and high school and high school in, in Canton? I went to high school, high school in Canton. Yeah, so after that, uh, what, After that, I went. I, I wanted to go into something to do with maybe drama, and my mother, who was a teacher in the high school and also a guidance counselor, found a college, a small college with a great drama department in Florida called Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida. I attended Rollins for four years, discovered I had no talent, <laughs> and so I changed majors and began to went with the business. Then went to graduate school in business up at Dartmouth at Amos Tuck School of Business, their MBA program. While I was there, I discovered that that really wasn't my calling. And so after my uh, first year at Dartmouth, I left and attended Vanderbilt to test my vocation for ministry at Vanderbilt Divinity School. Mm -hmm. And after I spent some time at Vanderbilt, I decided to join the Episcopal Church. I was at the time a Presbyterian. And when I changed churches, the Bishop of Tennessee said, I'd like to have you go to an Episcopal seminary and not a Presbyterian seminary or a or Divin or divinity school like mm -hmm. that, uh, Vanderbilt. So he said, would you mind going to school in California? That's our best seminary right now. I said, I have no problem. I'm single, I'll be glad to go. So I went and spent three years in Berkeley, California at the Episcopal Seminary, which is called CDSP, standing for Church Divinity School of the Pacific. And who was the bishop that sent you there? The bishop sent me there was a man named Bishop Barth, D.O. Barth. Yeah. And Bishop Barth sent me there. And the, <clears throat> the little footnote to this, though, is that when I was at Vanderbilt and wrote Bishop Barth, he turned me down. He, didn't want me to be it. So I came home to Canton and my father happened to know, everybody knew George Henry in Western North Carolina. He was the bishop, bishop of the Episcopal Church, though my father was a Presbyterian elder. My father knew him, a lot of people knew him. And my father said, why don't you go talk to Bishop Henry? So I came and talked to Jack Tootin at Trinity Church and Jack Tootin said, let me call uh, Bishop Henry and Bishop Henry accepted me. So when I went back to, to Vanderbilt and called Bishop Barth and said, thank you very much, but Bishop Henry, is, he said, I'll accept you. <laughs> so after I was turned down by Bishop Barth, I was accepted by Bishop Barth as a result of Bishop Henry. So I feel a very home at, at Deerfield because Jack Tootin's yeah. building name for him and then Bishop Henry a building name for him and the, both of those men created my ministry in the Episcopal Church. Awesome. Do you remember a, a favorite teacher that you've had either in college or seminary? Yeah. Or, mm -hmm. 
was a teacher I had in, in, in college. Her name was Florence Peterson, a woman, brilliant, gifted woman, who was, a, who was one of the American scholars in the labor movement and wrote the definitive work called uh, 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 All About Labor Unions. And, and she, was, she lived with the Ruthers in, in uh, Detroit for a while while we're finishing her PhD. She saw in me something I didn't see, and she told me that she, I was going to go to graduate school, and here's the schools, and she picked Dartmouth for me to attend, and so she worked all that out, and she changed my life. She, I, I could go on and on about her. I never saw her smile. I never thought she liked me. Matter of fact, I knew she didn't like me. It was one of those plays that was purely a scholar seeing in a student something she wanted to, to nurture and to uh, enhance, and, and she did, and it changed my life. Wow. How did you and your family uh, celebrate holidays? Special, any special memories? Yeah, we, we, we were not, we were a blue stocking Presbyterian family. My father and mother both were deep <clears throat> Presbyterians and very, uh, very much in that line of you don't have much fun. Fun is not something that is a, is a virtue. <laughs> so prudence and care and reserve and proper and dignity were all a, a part of that. So a celebration was never kind of like a, a, in living in New York, you see these Italian celebrations and so forth. They're huge and, and festive. We didn't have many festive things as, as blue stocking Presbyterians. So we had celebrations, but they were very modest and they were very contained because it would be inappropriate <laughs> to show too much eagerness and zest and, and frivolity. We didn't have any drinking. There was no beer or alcohol or wine of any kind in our family because that was not considered a part of our world. So when you say festivities, we had them, but they were very modest mm -hmm. relative to what we'd think of as a festive event today. Do you have any brothers and sisters? I have a brother, and one older brother. Are they still old. living? And he went to a college in Memphis at a place called Southwestern in those days, today's it called Rhodes College. <clears throat> and he was a music major, but he'd wound up going into the Episcopal Church too. And he went to seminary in uh, Cambridge at ETS, ETS. And uh, he was ordained and spent most of his ministry in Kansas and became a rector of a church in uh, the city of Lawrence, the one parish of the city called uh, Trinity Church Lawrence, where he was a rector for about 18, I think it's 18 years, and got cancer and died in, in there. But Is he older or younger? He's old, four years older. He was not just my brother, but he was my best friend. He was, we were very intimate in, his, in our theological thinking. And one of the interesting things we did, which I missed when he died, obviously, on Saturday night, I would preach my sermon to him on the phone, and then I finished, he would critique it, and then he would preach his sermon to me on Saturday night and critique it. And uh, I never will forget an example. One time I told this story in my sermon, a beautiful story, wonderful, powerful story. And my brother paused at the end and he said, Dan, that's a wonderful, beautiful, powerful story. It just doesn't have anything to do with the sermon. <laughs> which was correct, but it killed me because I liked the story, just didn't have work with us. But that was typical of what we would do for each other every set. And did that for, we did that to each other for years. When he died, needless to say, my sermons took a dive. <laughs> what brought you to this place uh, to retire here? When my parents died in Canton, North Carolina, they happened to <clears throat> strangely die very close, six weeks apart, both of them of heart attacks. And after they died, and they are, and we were, my brother and I received the inheritance from them, my brother said, we don't need it, you use it for whatever you wanted, 
And about the same time, my wife's uncle in Columbus, Ohio, who was really a hermit, she never met her uncle, but he had invested his funds. He had graduated from Yale as an engineer, and he invested. And lo and behold, we, in, we inherited from him a sizable sum. And that, with my parents, we combined it and bought the property that became known as the Swag. And that property we built a large log home, which was really designed to be a, a retreat center as well as our vacation. We had never owned a home. Mm -hmm. In the Episcopal Church, you could ask the church to buy your rectory. So we had never owned a home. The rectory had always been owned by the church. But this was our first home. So for 10 years, we ran the home as a kind of a retreat center on the weekends with youth groups and women. So for that, that's the week. And we built that not far from our, where I went to high school in Canton, up in the mountains on the edge of the park, edge of the Smoky Mountain National Park. So that's the reason we're here, having lived all those years part-time at the Swag, called the Swag Country Inn, we then, of course, knew about Deerfield, and we put our names in the pot and wound up getting this house, this you've cottage. Been, you've been here how long? I've been here five years five now. Years. Okay. Well, you mentioned your wife. Tell me about her and how you all met. Yeah, good. Well, <clears throat> she was at Rollins College. She happened to be a senior the year I enrolled as a freshman, but she was in charge of freshman orientation, it was called. And I got to know her sort of that during that freshman week that we were, and she was so much older, I didn't really date her. We'd have coffee together and we were friends. And then she went on and graduated. Well, nine years later, I discovered that her husband, who was a graduate of the academy in, in, uh, in, in uh, Annapolis and a pilot off a carrier, he'd had a plane crash. And I wrote her a letter and said, can I come by and see you? I'm going to be in Washington where she lived. So we got together and, and met and decided to have another date or two. And then pretty soon we were dating and then got married nine years after we first met as students at Rollins. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> what what came from that marriage? Do you have children? Yes, uh, we, we uh, when we got married, she had had a child by John Sangster, her first husband, and that child was about three years old when we married. So I adopted Gail, and then after that, we had another child named Dan Junior, Dan Daniel Paul Junior, and he is an Episcopal priest, mm -hmm. having just retired from St. Luke's in Atlanta. And then we had a third child, Lauren, who was a teacher in a prep school, St. Worcester Academy in Worcester, Mass. And they, they, she has four children, my son has two, and then a Gail, our daughter, has two. So we have eight grandchildren with our three children, Gail, a Diener and I had. Tell me about Diener, what is she like? Well, Diener, Diener is an extrovert. She is over the chart, over the top extrovert, which makes her a wonderful innkeeper, which is what she absolutely adored doing. Uh, she could hardly wait for the next car to drive up to the front door of the swag and open the door and welcome him, see who it was, and be, because an extrovert gets, as you know, energy from other people, and she just loves the fact that there are other people coming to the inn. So Diener's extrovert personality, plus the fact that she's a phenomenal cook, and she did all the cooking for the first few years of the inn, which made it sort of just perfect fit for her, both the hospitality and the, and the cooking aspect and the domestic aspect was all fit right up her skill uh, set so she was a perfect innkeeper for all those many many years And you are not an extrovert? Well, not anything like she is. No, I, I have to get away a little bit. She I'm 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 not an introvert by any means, but But when you compare my chart When we took the personality my chart I go this far she goes off the page 
his next <laughs> word. So going back, what were you like as a boy growing up? Uh, what were your interests? Who were your friends? Yes, I, I, I grew up in a, a little different in that I was an outsider in a mill town. So if you grow up having been born and raised and with an accent from Chicago <clears throat> in Canton, we were two new students in the whole school system, my brother and I, the only two new students in the whole school system. Well, you could see that that was pretty much of a mill town, and therefore I, in some ways, I didn't fit in. I liked being there, and I enjoyed the mountains very much, but it wasn't really where I was from. And so in a sense, growing up in that high school, I became friends with people and made good friends, but still I was not what you would call a part of that culture in the same way had I been born there. So I, I have to look back at my high school and say I liked being there, I liked high school, but it wasn't like I was integrated into it. When I got to college, it was much different. I was far more engaged and got very active in the student life of the college and became president of the student body at the college, which of course was in part because I, I felt like I totally fit in. Any particular stories that have been passed down uh, in your family? Uh, no, there, there are. The stories that we have in our family are stories really that centered around my mother and father mm -hmm. and their relationship to this famous evangelist, Billy Sunday, who at the time yeah. was just as famous as Billy Graham is to, for us today. So they had an enormously exciting, glamorous world. They went from city to city and had these big rallies and, mm -hmm. and uh, tabernacle settings. So they lived in a, in a glamorous, almost show business type world all the time. And they went from hotel to hotel to hotel in major cities. I've gone into a few cities and gone to the public library <clears throat> to ask about uh, where is, is you have a file for the Billy Sunday campaign that was here back in the 20s. Well, there are, there are pictures and pictures of my father playing the piano and uh, yeah. with Mr. Homer Rodehaver and they were, they were, they did the sort of things that uh, we Episcopalians are not as familiar with, but they would warm up the congregation for 45 minutes by yeah. singing and doing things. The men sing this verse and the women sing this verse and the third verse will be played by Mr. Rodehaver on the trombone, you know. And the fourth verse, my father would play it all by himself, a piano solo, and mm -hmm. all of that sort of show business combined with preaching was a part of my life growing up. Though I didn't experience it, I heard story after story, yeah. and they met people like the Astors and the <clears throat> Rockefellers and those famous families who all wanted to be a part when Mr. Sunday came to town to preach. Fascinating. So let's go uh, to your first job, and how has your career and job skills changed over the years? A yeah, good question. Yeah, I, uh, the bishop in Tennessee at the time was a man named Van Dross. Bishop Van Dross sent me to a village when you come out of seminary. He said, I'll give you this he gave me two tiny missions, tiny. One of them had about 20 people in it and the other one had about 30 people in it. And the, those two missions were near Swanee, Tennessee, where the University of Tennessee, uh, University, South, uh, University of the South sits. One was in a town called Mont Eagle. It was, one was out in the kind of the woods called Tickbush. And it was not anywhere near anything, but it was a little small, concrete block building. That was St. James and Holly Comforter was in the little village, 800 people of Mont Eagle. Those were my two cures every Sunday. Well, 
to be honest, I wasn't suited for that. I had just left Berkeley, California. <laughs> From Berkeley, California to the mountains of Tennessee, I just, I just wasn't very good at it. I wasn't set up for it. I didn't speak the language. I didn't understand the culture and they didn't understand mine particularly either. So I loved those people, they were dear people. So I didn't stay there very long. Then I got a chance to become the assistant in a big, huge church in Memphis called Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. And I worked under a man named Eric Greenwood who'd been there for about 15 years. When I moved there, I stayed there six years and that was a wonderful experience where I worked mainly with the youth. And I did a lot of different youth work things. I ran a camp for those teenagers in Wyoming in the Grand Tetons. I established a nightclub in the new gymnasium. Every Friday night we have a nightclub for teenage boys and girls with rock bands every Friday night. We did a lot of things that was very exciting, which was much more in keeping with my imagination and creativity and energy than the the rural mountains of, of, of East Tennessee. So that was my next cure. After that, I got a call to be in charge of a church in Nashville, a small growing church called St. David's on the edge of the city. And that became, for the next seven years when I was there, we became the fastest growing Episcopal church in, in Tennessee. And we moved from 100 members to 500 members while I was there. And it was a very thrilling, exciting church. Almost everybody in that church went to the same high school. Everybody shopped in the same shopping mall. Everybody kind of played cards together. And that's, it was really a, a church that was easy to grow because everybody kind of wanted to know everybody. When I left St. David's in Nashville, a suburban church, I went to the downtown church in Knoxville, the old mother church called St. John's, now the Cathedral of East Tennessee. That was a radical move, but I decided that the hardest ministry in the church was downtown, and it was, it still is, but I wanted that challenge of downtown where you have different kinds of people. Just quick story, when I sat down with the youth group. God, I'd been doing the youth work in Memphis. I thought I'll have a great youth group. I sat down, there were 11 kids in high school in a circle, 11. And I went around because I knew how important high school was when you're in high school. 11 different kids were in 11 different high schools. You do not build a good group when each kid is angry at the other kid's school having been defeated by their football team the night for Friday night before. I discovered that you have different kinds of ministries when you're in downtown churches. You have people who are single who attend the church. Well, you almost never have in a suburban church single people. Not only single people, you have people who are very old in a downtown church. You don't in suburban. You have people very young, very old. And so to meld and bring together into community, in sort of some sort of worshiping, caring community, a downtown. Well, that was my Knoxville experience, which was very exciting, very difficult in the beginning to make it happen. But then I knew I wanted to stay downtown, and I moved from Knoxville downtown to Atlanta downtown to Manhattan downtown. <clears throat> Tell me about those. Well, St. Luke's and Atlanta. St. Luke's Atlanta was a, it was a church right down on Peachtree Street in the middle of downtown that served mainly the street people. Though it was a suburban members, they had a very great interest in the urban setting. And so I established what was called a drop-in shelter which was for poor people, I mean, street people who didn't have any place to go during the day. We had a drop-in shelter. We had all kinds of ministry for street people. And when I left Atlanta, I went to New York and established what we called a drop-in shelter in Wall, uh, Wall Street. Very controversial, but it was there. And by ministry, all the rest of my time until I retired in New York 
in, 19, uh, 2000, in 2004 was urban ministry and urban settings. And I established a, not only a drop-in shelter, but I established a homeless, so for a place for homeless, to, for, for chronic homeless. The urban ministry is a complex issue trying to deal with not just street people, which is of course one, but also dealing with the systemic issues of what creates homelessness and what makes the urban life so difficult for the poor. Now this is at Trinity, right? Trinity Wall Street, right. Mm -hmm. So you have some stories about uh, Trinity and a major event that happened. I might, have, might as well ask you about that. Uh, yeah, the major, the major event, of course, was what 9/11. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that Trinity is made up of two churches. The original church called Trinity Wall Street was in late 1600s, was built, and that's right after the English took over New Amsterdam and they changed the name from New Amsterdam to New York and they brought in their church because the church and the state in England are at one. When they brought in this little church, they set it up out on the edge of town, up against the wall, the wall to keep the Indians out. And there was a little dirt street there. And right there is where they set up the wall, same place it's been for 350 years, three, Wall Street Church. Now, that church, in 1766, 10 years before July 4th, 10 years before, they decided to build what they considered sort of a suburban church, it wasn't that, but it was a church that was about six blocks north. And though they established this church called St. Paul's Chapel, six blocks north, a spectacular, beautiful stone chapel, just idyllic in its beauty, and it, is exactly the way it was originally built. St. Trinity is in its third building. St. Paul's is in the original building. And St. Paul's turned out to be right across the street from the World Trade Center. So when the World Trade Center came down, St. Paul's right across the street naturally became a kind of a recovery place. So we opened it up and allowed all those people who were working on the pile, we called it, all the debris, mm -hmm. working on there, looking for bodies, trying to discover if anybody was still alive. Those working people came into St. Paul's, got something to eat, lay down on the pews, took a nap, and then got a massage, and then went back to the pile. So St. Paul's, my, other, my second church, became kind of almost iconic in its symbolism for recovery and for eight months 24 hours a day we had people from all over the nation fly in the average was a person would take a week off from work fly to new york and take one of the one of the ships either either the 12 hour overnight shift or the 12 hour daytime shift a 12 hour shift mm -hmm. volunteers nobody was paid Everything was volunteer. It's a wonderful ministry. And people's lives, I mean, lives were changed in this ministry for their eight months. It's very hard to end it because it was so sacred in, our, in the lives and, and hearts of those people who worked, who volunteered there and helped FEMA workers, police officers, firefighters, those people who were working at the pile. What organizations have you been part of, and what do they do? Well, quite a few. Uh, the few, the, those that I've been a part of in chairing and creating, one was called uh, National Interfaith Cable Coalition. It was, uh, the cable companies got very discouraged by the, uh, cable companies' exploit, ex, exploitation of preachers who were, they thought, inappropriate in the way they had preached and raised money. And so one of the men who was most powerful in the cable industry, his name is John Malone. He's still one of the great 
uh, owners of cable industry, in the cable industry. John Malone came to a few of us in New York and said, if you will put together the religions of America, I'll put together the cable companies of America and we'll put one channel on every cable system called like C-SPAN for, for government, we'll have a C-SPAN for religion and all the religions will be on. So I began putting together and I wound up putting together 56 denominations. Mm. It was wound up being called Odysseys and that network got so, the channels got so valuable that the local cable company said, we can't put religion on, we gotta make money off that channel. We can't give it free. So we wound up so selling our channel to a company called Hallmark Greeting Cards in Kansas City. So when you see on your channel, Hallmark, that was our channel. That was the Odyssey Networks of Religion which worked until it didn't work. Yeah. It didn't work because of the, the, the cost. Right. But I started that and was the chairman of the board of that for 25 years and very proud of that. So you mentioned your, your dad and your mom in terms of music. So the next question is, how does music impact your life? And how has it impacted your life? And what kind of music do you like? I, I'm... I'm I'm embarrassed to say that my father tried to teach me piano, but I knew more than he did, of course, when I was taking lessons, or I thought I did. And so I didn't really learn, to, nor did my brother learn to play the piano. I wound up being a drummer and um, loved it in high school. I went to the what was then called Transylvania Music Camp each summer, which is now called the Brevard Music Center, which was still has these musicians come in. And I was there in the summers playing the drums and the timpani with the uh, faculty orchestra. I loved that, but I never was a musician in the truest sense of the word. Is there a particular kind of music that you love? Oh, I love jazz. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and when I was in San Francisco as a student in Berkeley, I, every chance I got, I went to a jazz club called Blackhawk in San Francisco. And I, I, I really love progressive jazz, which is in that, but I, I've never kind of grown out of that. So I still think of, of modern jazz music as some of the best it's ever written on. Do you have any hobbies or playing sports? Yes, yeah, photography. Yeah. I have been a photographer all my life. In about the sixth grade, my mother gave me a little set from Sears and Roebuck that allowed me to develop my own pictures. And a little, a little set with some chemicals. And that day, she we put a little dark room in the basement, and I began developing. And I have had many cameras and many, and I have had a dark room. I don't have a dark room in New York, and I, and I didn't have a dark don't have a dark room obviously at Deerfield, but processing photographs and enlarging them and cropping them, and, and I did weddings for for years. And when I was a high school student, I did photograph weddings, and then for the yearbook for the Holly High School, and for the yearbook for college, and I was the college photographer. At, in college, and so yes, photography is my love. However, I've never kind of transferred the competence that I had in, in black and white and color film to digital. And the digital is, a whole, for me, a whole other world, and you think of it in an entirely different way mm -hmm. than you do film and, and, and black and white and color. Okay, we're gonna step back a little bit how has the world changed since you were young? The world has changed every day in my life. Uh, I think that one of the most difficult things in the church has been that the concept that things that don't change are the good and change things that are changing all the time are not the good. In fact, it's the opposite. 
God is making things new all the time, but we theologically in the church have not been able to translate at, into a common denominator for the understanding of the nature of church and theology. So that those famous words, we have never done it that way before, seem to, to prevail in the church. And for a minister to live with that, then the change becomes something that's an obstacle, something to be overcome, something to fight, when in fact it's the opposite. It's something to embrace the new as it, as it or not always, but usually can present something of a new beginning, a new, a new life, a new way of knowing, a new, if you will, epistemology. And for us, our epistemology of the past is the only way to go. How do we know in the old way? You can't accept how to know in the new way. And so my entire ministry has been struggling with how do we accept the fact that black people are equal in every way? How do we accept the fact that girls can be acolytes? That was a fight. How do we accept the fact that women can be on vestries? That was a fight. How do we accept the fact that, that we could ordain gay and lesbian people? How do we accept, it goes on. That's been my ministry. And when you say, how has my ministry changed? It has been a constant change and have been a constant challenge, not just to my priesthood, but to all my peers, that, 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 that you are constantly maintaining a church, but helping it change and grow and become what God is calling us to be. That, that is really a very difficult thing because the Episcopal Church has not stayed st stood still. We've moved ahead, and when we, in moving ahead, it has cost us, and it's still costing us every day, as you know. What would you say are the greatest challenges that you have faced in your life? Loving my neighbor as myself. Perhaps the greatest challenge is to say, it's not about me. I, I live, as I think most of us do, in a world that says, it's all about me. Everything's about me. The more I can think about me, the more money I'll make. The more I think about me, the more successful I'll be. The more I take care of myself, the stronger I'll be. But in truth, in truth, the gospel is about the more I think about you, the more I can empty myself in you, the more I become me and what God made me to be. Yeah, becoming a servant. Servant leadership is talked about, but it is very, very hard to do in the dominant culture that says over and over again, with every advertisement I see, it's all about me. When in fact, biblically, it's all about my neighbor. And that's the way Jesus put it, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Of course, you have to love yourself. You have to take care of yourself and nurture yourself in order that you might have roots deep enough to go out on a limb. Okay, uh, have you experienced or observed prejudice or racism in your life? And how? Yes, uh, I have uh, many, many times, constantly on some levels. I. have resisted it and and challenged it when it seemed appropriate and even sometimes when it wasn't appropriate 
I hired, uh, when I went to Atlanta, Atlanta's really a black city in many ways, and I hired a man who was a professor of law, but an Episcopal priest, black man, at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, and I asked him if he would move with me when I went to, to Atlanta to take this downtown church at St. Luke's. I said, I'm not going unless you come with me because I need a black priest on that staff in that city. He took a $10,000 cut and got rid of tenure, which was his, and came with me. He was the first full-time black priest in any white congregation in the South. Mm. So I did all I knew how to do and paid an enormous price when he decided he was single when he decided to marry a white woman in the parish, which created enormous issues. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I think I have faced it, understood it, worked with it everywhere I've been, even in New York, but mainly, mainly in the South. It's it's so pervasive, it is so ever-present, it is really the, the sin of the nation, as we have all called it sometimes. And yes, I, we're coming through, we're doing good, we're doing very well with it, I've done lots of levels. And uh, of course today we announced, the paper announced that uh, the, uh, Harry Belafonte who was a leader, and he and I walked together over the thing between Selma and, and, and Montgomery. And uh, on the 40th anniversary of the Selma March, he and I and our son walked that walk together with mm -hmm. Belafonte. It was a wonderful moment. But yes, yes, I've experienced it. And yes, it's been a very great issue for all of us. But I am very proud of the Episcopal Church for having taken the leadership it has taken. Very proud. Last question. What has provided you with the most satisfaction in life? What are you most proud of? Uh, There are a number of things, including my three children, who are just wonderful. But that's that's probably unfair to be the only proud of. I mean, to hold them out as the only thing. I think your question is trying to dig deep into a a way of of, of figuring out a talent. I think God gave me an ability to speak and to preach to this age in a way that was uh, healing, uh, instructive, and memorable and manageable. And therefore, I've been blessed to preach in more than 40 different states in the United States and been invited to to go lots of places for that. And probably I am, I am grateful to the Lord for the ability to do that and to have been able to do that in so many different places and in different ways. And uh, to have been honored by the Queen uh, with the uh, uh, Order of the British Empire and then to have received from various universities and schools, six honorary doctorates. So those have been great joy for me to be able to feel the, 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 the reward that comes with having done what I think the Lord wanted me to do. Thank you so much. Really appreciate talking with you. Well, thank you. Bye.